So most of the stories about the Mar-a-Lago raid uh, report that this is over the National Archives records that weren't returned by uh, Donald Trump to them. And the raid so far focuses on the fact that they took those records back. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about what I think is really going on here and link this to what I believe is the story about the fake electors and the Jan January 6th committee. And I'm going to show that by kind of some of the things that's going on. First, uh, let's look at how search warrants work. So let's refresh our memory a little bit about that. Um, the AP reports, FBI agents can't just show up on a search prop to search a property such as Mar-a-Lago. Investigators first need to obtain a search warrant, which requires convincing a judge they have probable cause that a crime occurred. Federal authorities seeking a search warrant present their evidence and the basis for needing to search a property in an affidavit reviewed by a federal magistrate or district court judge. Magistrate judges are not nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Instead, they are appointed by district court judges to handle matters such as search warrant applications and defendants' initial court appearances. The judge can ask for additional information and question the agent seeking the search warrant under oath. The judge will only sign off on the warrant if there is probable cause, there is evidence of a federal crime, at the location authorities want to search. Given the sensitivity of an ongoing inve investigation involving a former president, there must have been a serious amount of deliberation by both the Justice Department and the judge. Eh, I doubt it. Uh, I'll turn your attention down here. The search warrant application process happens in secret in order to avoid tipping off the person whose property may be searched. Any court records related to the warrant application would be sealed. So that's the affidavit for the search warrant. That's that can typically be sealed. The person has no idea what charges are coming, that kind of thing. And But it is typical to give a person a copy of the search warrant, not the affidavit. These records typically remain under seal unless and until a criminal case is brought. And even then, authorities may try to keep the affidavit from public view. The person whose property is being searched is entitled to see the warrant, but not the affidavit. The other thing that happens with the warrant is it does reveal some information. So if a person gets their hands on a copy of the warrant, it tells them what they're looking for because they are supposed to be specific in a warrant. It can't be, we think there's a crime, so we're going to go take every piece of paperwork from a person's property. Instead, it would be focused. If you were looking for, for example, embezzlement, you would want documents related to that embezzlement, and you wouldn't be looking for drugs or things like that, for example, legal drugs. If you came across them, yes, that could be a case of they were discovered in the process of searching for something else. But in terms of paperwork, you wouldn't read all the paperwork and documentation to uncover everything to see if it relates to that crime. You would look for things that are specific to that. And that would be listed in there in the search warrant. And if you got a copy of that search warrant as the person being searched, that might give you some clue as to what they're actually trying to find. It could have been very specific in detailing the things that could be searched for, and that might be the reason why that wasn't revealed and it was shown to Trump's attorney from like 10 feet away. So now with that in mind, um, let's talk about what they call the fake electors plot. Um, this was the the basis for the idea that Trump had an alternate slate of electors gathered for the election and that that was somehow improper. I'm here to tell you that if you contest a any kind of election, you would need an alternate slate of electors. It's typical that there's always two slates of electors for a state in this case and if you were to go to court and say, hey, there was something wrong with this election and the judge was to rule in your favor, he would have he would require that you have that slate of electors so that he would have a remedy for ruling in your favor. Um, it is not uncommon. It is part of the process to have, you know, multiple sets of electors. And ultimately, this came down on January 6th that Pence was tasked with reading in the electors into the record. Uh, and he could choose that if he he's the one that if he feels that the this thing was contested he could read in the alternate slate of electors uh, it's perfectly legal it's an open question if he must read 
as it's submitted. And there's something called the Electoral Count Act, where the House and the Senate can object and decide if there's dual electors and things like that. You would need a senator and you need, would need a uh, House member to both agree to contest the election. And then there's something called the 1877 Electoral Count Act, which has been used in cases where there's two different sets of electors. For example, in 1960, it was used when there was two different sets of electors uh, sent in from the state of Hawaii. And there's something called the, the House voting for, voting by state delegation that's in the 12th Amendment. So this is all a part of the process for determining who's president. The person is not president-elect until it is all certified through Congress on January 6th. So to say that somebody won an election by all the counts and all that other stuff when things are still going on is not correct. Um, and we know that throughout this, Trump was trying to get lawsuits and stuff in different states. And there was a lot of stuff like, well, the election's over. You know, there's, there's nothing we can do about this. Um, but we know, you know, and this may get me in trouble on YouTube, but there were states with problems. They had mail-in voting. A lot of that mail-in voting um, was found to be uh, suspect. Uh, the confidence in the election was very bad. And the, these things were allowed in some states without the legislation of those states making the law allowing for that to happen. You had executive branches of the government, for example, saying, oh, we're going to allow mail-in voting. We're going to allow those mail-ins to come in you know, whatever, however long they take to get in the mail, we'll count them days after the election. That's not secure. The other thing is signature matching wasn't performed in a lot of these places, which is supposed to be the hallmark of telling if that ballot is for the person uh, that it was sent to, that it was mailed to. Uh, we had a lot of places where they were just mailing out ballots to everyone, regardless if they asked for those ballots to come in. So... And there is a history of votes being overturned in the court, uh, including state elections and stuff like that, where the judges come in and said, no, the Democrat didn't win. Uh, There's widespread cheating, and this is actually in the Republicans' favor, and Democrats out, Republicans in. And regardless of that, how people feel about the election is a big sign of whether the election is secure or not. I think if you have a majority of people say that there was something hokey, then that is not a secure election. And I think it's our elected officials' jobs to make sure that that fits within what the American public wants. They should get secure elections by closing up all those holes. But regardless, Biden won by the most total votes and the fewest total counties of any president-elect. And I know we had an unprecedented mail-in ballot, you know, time due to COVID. Um, but I got to ask, what happens in 2024? We've seen all this stuff with COVID where it's sticking around and they're talking about lockdowns and wear the mask. So is this now a requirement for elections that they have to have mail-in voted voting because, you know, pandemics can happen? Um, I don't know. But uh, on the bright side of this, Trump has raised the most money ever. His war chest is now higher than the Republicans and Democrats combined. Um, but I really feel that this is about the FBI and their subpoenas of, you know, fake elector, the fake electors plot. And we see from this article, the FBI subpoenas Pennsylvania GOP lawmakers in 2020 fake electors plot. Republican legislators in Pennsylvania received subpoenas from the FBI Tuesday and Wednesday as part of the investigation in the scheme to use false slates of electors to overturn the state's 2020 election result and keep former President Donald Trump in office, according to the report. So I, I don't think it's any kind of coincidence that they raided Mar-a-Lago under the idea that we're going to get records from the presidential, uh, you know, the presidential records and stuff like that that go to the archives. And then while they were there, Anything that would be related to the election, they would take, and that would give them, you know, cause to dig into this further to try to find something which 
I don't know how they could, where him having an alternate slate of electors, which is the process, having that as being some kind of crime. And the fact that they're going after, you know, sitting members of Congress and Pennsylvania Republicans shows that they're digging into this deeply. And I don't think it's a coincidence. FBI agents delivered subpoenas or otherwise visited several House and Senate Republican offices in Harrisburg. The outlet added that some of the lawmakers were told they are not targets of the investigation, but could have information relevant to the FBI's probe. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. The news of the subpoenas broke one day after Rep. Scott Perry, Republican of Pennsylvania, the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus and a Trump stalwart, revealed his cell phone had been seized by FBI agents. Perry's campaign released a new statement late Wednesday that said his attorneys had been informed by the Justice Department that he is not a target of the probe. I've directed them to, co to cooperate with the Justice Department in order to ensure that it gets the information to which it's entitled, but to protect information to which it's not, including communications that are protected under, free, under the Speech and Debate Clause of the United States Constitution. After the initial phone seizure, Perry issued a statement to Fox News blasting the Justice Department and Attorney General <clears throat> Merrick Garland. I'm outraged, though not surprised. Uh, we've heard all these kind of things before, but, uh, you know, regardless, I think the fact that they're searching these people from Pennsylvania, uh, Rep. Scott Perry uh, is from Pennsylvania, I think they're trying to make a case that Trump said something to the legislator of Pennsylvania about getting the electors and stuff in order, and I think they're tr going to try to use that to say that he interfered with the uh, 2020 election and therefore, indirectly, the things that happened on January 6th. And I could be wrong, but my gut feeling tells me that this is what they're after here. They're going after Trump. They're trying it from different avenues. I think this involves a January 6th committee. 